Welcome to Gazette. Gazette! This is our podcast, This Month in Fashion, for the month of December and January 2021. Today, we'll tell you about this month's most important happenings in the world of fashion, beauty and luxury. So, put your headphones on and go walk the dog or something and stay up to date with the latest in the industry. If we talk about something you need to see, like a magazine cover or a campaign, we'll tell you to look at your phone if you can. If you missed November's episode, click up here to listen. It's worth it, if only to look at Harry Styles twice on Gucci and on Vogue. Oh yeah! <laughs> okay, let's get started with our top stories. I think we can agree the biggest piece of news over the last couple of months was the Joe Biden inauguration. That's of course not counting the Capitol insurrection, which, uh, shall we say, has a lot less for us to talk about fashion-wise. We'll focus on the good news and on the fashion we saw that day, which, we have to say, has given quite a bit to talk about. Let's start with the lady of the hour, Vice President Kamala Harris. She used every opportunity she got during the ceremonies of the transfer of power to support an American creator of color. For this most important day, when the first woman, person of color and first South Asian got sworn in as vice president, she chose a bright purple dress designed by Christopher John Rogers. The young designer is still in his 20s and was born in Louisiana. He is, of course, based in New York City. She wore the dress with Manolo Blahnik pumps and with her signature pearls by Puerto Rican jewelry Wilfredo Rosal. The First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, wore a look created specially for the occasion by Marcarian, a three-year-old brand founded by designer Alexandra O'Neill. The brand is named after a galaxy, actually. The look was a blue tweed coat and dress with velvet lapel. She wore matching gloves and pumps. Hillary Clinton wore a Ralph Lauren ensemble and, like Harris, she chose purple. The color was seen a lot that day because of the theme of the ceremony was America United and the mix of red and blue, the colors of the political parties create purple. Michelle Obama looked amazing <laughs> in a plum monochrome look that consisted of white pants, a turtleneck and a coat, with a head-turning belt with a big gold buckle. The ensemble was designed by Sergio Hudson, who hails from South Carolina and is based in Los Angeles. The political women all wore American designers and mostly showed support to emerging brands owned by women and minorities. Vice President Harris' stepdaughter caught a lot of attention with her look. She chose a Miu Miu plate coat with embroidered embellishments cascading from the shoulders, which contrasted with her nerdy eyeglasses. The whole look had a very fashion-forward vibe. And speaking of fashion-forward, young poet Amanda Gorman cut the spotlight through her words, but we're sure that canary yellow coat didn't hurt. If you're looking at your screen and you've seen the red satin headband, then you probably guessed who made her look. Well, Mucha Prada, of course. <laughs> Another performer that was there to steal looks was undoubtedly Lady Gaga. She wore a spectacular haute couture Elsa Schiaparelli gown. The dress was long-sleeved and black. The skirt was very voluminous and red. She wore it with a golden piece dove brooch. Daniel Roseberry, designer of the Maison, designed it for the occasion. He's an American himself. Finally, J.Lo wore a white Chanel look from the Fall Winter 2020 collection. A mention of honor goes to Joe Biden's granddaughters, who wore monochrome looks in three different colors that harmonized well together. You can see it on your screen now. We don't really cover men's fashion here, but it's worth noting that President Biden wore a Ralph Lauren suit and coat. And, of course, the most viral look of the event was that of Senator Bernie Sanders with his good old Burns jacket and very thick wool gloves. So funny. <laughs> okay, our next story is basically the definition of good news. Sex and the City is coming back. Yay! <laughs> okay, we have to admit it's not precisely good news for everyone because Samantha, that is to say Kim Cattrall, will not be coming back. The series reboot will be called And Just Like That and the filming will start only this year, so we won't know how to explain the absence of the character until next year probably. What do you think? Do you think it will be the same without her? Um, I don't know. I watched a TV show where she was um communicating that she didn't want to do any more of uh, the sex and the city series because she didn't get along with the team yeah i heard that she really 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 uh, dislikes i mean she and and uh, sarah jessica parker really dislike each other 
So it's logical that you don't want to go work with someone you don't like, but I think for the fans, it's going to be really sad to not have one of the most beloved characters back. I think it won't be the same, but they can take another perspective maybe. Yeah, and uh, it's going to be interesting because now they're going to be like 50 years old and before it was like, oh, single ladies in the city. And now it's like older, <laughs> you know? Older single ladies. Yeah, but maybe it will change our perspective about 50 year olds, no? Because I know that when I was younger, we used to think of 50 year olds like old people, but I don't think they are old people anymore. <laughs> So it's good. I'm, I, I can't wait to see how they manage that. Well, what's sure is that fans of the series or not, it promises to deliver on the fashion department as legendary stylist Patricia Field will be coming back to work on the series. You might recognize her work from the original series or from such iconic looks such as Devil Wear Prada and Emily in Paris. Our next story is the naming of Naomi Osaka, the Japanese tennis player of mixed Japanese and Haitian heritage, as a new house ambassador of Louis Vuitton. She has used her fame to speak of racial injustice and has been named by the brand as one of the most explosive and influential tennis players of all time. You can see one of her first images with the brand on your screen now. We think she looks fabulous. I mean, good for Louis Vuitton for going for an athlete instead of an actress or a singer like they normally do. And for trying to be more inclusive on their ambassador's choices. By the way, guys, if you feel like you're keeping up with the news, don't forget to give this episode of This Month in Fashion a thumbs up. And subscribe to Like Gazette if you haven't done so yet. Now to the collab of the season. You already know we're talking about the collab that turned the internet crazy. Of course, the North Face by Gucci collab. The outwear brand collaborated with the Italian designer Alessandro Michele of Gucci and they presented a capsule collection comprising outwear like puffer jackets and windbreakers, dresses, pants, shoes, backpacks and other accessories. At first, the collection was only available in pop-up stores in New York and Chicago. Then you could enter a raffle to be able to buy online. Finally, the collection, or what was left of it, became available to shop online for anyone at the end of January. You can still get a few pieces, so if you're looking to go glamping soon, go to gucci.com now. You can look at your screen again for a visual of the collection. And now off to our media section. Big news in the world of media, coming from the monarch of fashion media herself, Anna Wintour. As you may know, Condé Nast has been struggling to become profitable for a while now. They have closed or diminished some titles and the time for a shake-up at Vogue finally arrived. No, Anna is not fired, of course, but there are some major changes to talk about. For one, I don't know if you knew this, but the international and US editions of Condé Nast were separated before and they have now been consolidated. And the largest titles, like Vogue, of course, will be streamlined, meaning that instead of creating content and finding advertising locally, the whole thing will be managed as one big unit. Anna Wintour will be more powerful still, as she will not only oversee content for Vogue internationally, but for all titles of Condé Nast, except for the New Yorker. On this side of the Atlantic, Edward Enninful was named European Editorial Director, meaning he will oversee the French, German, Spanish and Italian editions. Uh, Edward Enninful, of course, is the editor-in-chief of British Vogue. Of these, the German and Spanish local editors-in-chief have left their positions. All of this, of course, is an attempt to become more profitable as the company has suffered great loss in print advertising for the past decade. The challenge of this strategy will, of course, be how to keep titles relevant at the local level, while producing content for an international audience. And we have one more piece of news from Vogue, and that is the Kamala Harris cover, which, for a few different reasons, ended up being quite controversial. You can have a look at your screen to look at the two versions that were released. The pictures were taken by young African-American photographer Tyler Mitchell. He first became famous after photographing Beyoncé's cover a couple of years ago, and uh, he became also the first black photographer to ever shoot a Vogue cover. The controversies of the vice president's cover were many. First of all, apparently the Harris team and the magazine had agreed upon going to print with the image where she's wearing a light blue suit. 
This is a Michael Kors collection suit, a choice that makes perfect sense as the American designer is a Vogue advertiser and in general very friendly to the magazine. However, the final cover got leaked and the picture was not the one convened on originally, but this other one, where she's wearing a casual black blazer on black jeans and her signature shoe wear converses. Not long after, Vogue published the Michael Kors image and announced it as a digital cover. This seemed to have been done to appease the Harris team as they felt blindsided. We want to clarify that this info does not come from an official source, but from anonymous sources that claim to be close to the VP and spoke to the media. Anyway, the controversy doesn't end there. As many people were outraged with the choice of a more casual picture over the more formal and vice presidential one. Plus, there were a lot of complaints about the, the background picked for the cover image and there were even some claims of skin tone lightening. What do you think? I think this picture, it's, um, it shows the style of the photographer, Tyler Mitchell. You can see his work, it's amazing. But I don't know if I will have chosen that picture for a cover yeah. and for the vice president, uh, vice president cover. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, it looks like more vice presidential, um, the, the first choice, the Michael Kors choice. But uh, I don't think that, I think that these claims that the skin was lightened and everything, it, they, they are unfounded. You know, I think if you look at Tyler Mitchell's work, he works with analog cameras and this, the, this, uh, uh, cameras do do this to the skin you know they kind of uh, make the colors fade a little in general you can see it with with the background even and with the clothes so I don't think I don't think these are founded as for the choice of the picture I mean I, I think Vogue had the reasons <laughs> but I don't know what they could have been because it's not a better image in my opinion it's a good image for the editorial so maybe for um, the pages inside the, the magazine and not the cover. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, it's a, she looks approachable and nice and, and, you know, like she works hard, you know, ready to work, but it's not a cover of a vice president, you know, in my, again, in my opinion. <laughs> but hey, I'm no Anna Winter. <laughs> <laughs> For our business news, we have a couple of changes in some major fashion houses to report. First of all, at the end of last year, we got the announcement that after three years at the helm of Chloe, designer Natasha Ramsey Levy was leaving the Maison. A few days after, Uruguayan designer Gabriela Hurst was chosen as her successor. Hurst was based in New York and has an eponymous label, well known for its luxurious and sustainable DNA. We can't wait to see what she'll do for Chloe and we'll find out in the first week of March during Paris Fashion Week. Another naming was Florence Tétier at the head of Jean-Paul Gaultier. This is the first time someone other than Gaultier himself will be designer under his brand. Finally, on our business news of the day, we wanted to share with you a move that could prove to be highly influential to the industry as a whole. We'll give you some background. Remember the beginning of the pandemic when everyone was questioning their own existence? Mm. Well, something like that started happening to the fashion industry as well. Designer Dries Van Noten started an organization called Forum and Fashion B2B Media, Business of Fashion, launched Rewiring Fashion. The objective of both was to end some of the many problems with the industry today, including massive discount sales and an illogical fashion calendar. Meaning, uh, big retailers were always selling products on sales and forcing calendars that didn't coincide with the weather. Uh, you had puffy coats hitting the stores in August, for example. This was especially hard to smaller and independent brands. Yeah, these problems have more or less existed for a long time, but for the first time at the beginning of this pandemic, people started openly addressing them. Now, at the end of last year, both organizations decided their objectives were too aligned not to join forces, and so they did. We hope this newfound openness will help solve these problems and make it easier for young designers to find a way to profitability. What do you think about this? I think it's about damn time. I mean, I don't know if, if something can come from this like uh, right away, you know, because uh, it's, uh, it's big, big uh, industry changes that need to be done. And of course, there are many small brands suffering because of the pandemic. But on the long run, at least, I think new objectives need to be set. To, to fight uh, these systemic problems. It's a good start, I think. Yes, I agree completely. 
Well, that's it for this month in fashion, this time for two months, December and January 2021. If you're still listening, you probably like this episode, so don't forget to give us a thumbs up and share this content with anyone you might think might find it interesting. Also, subscribe to our channel and hit the notifications bell to be amongst the first to watch our next video. Thanks for listening and see you soon! At Lagazette! Bye! <laughs>